Is this thing on? Oh, what's up? Just kidding. I'm obviously way beyond that. Uh, all right. What's up, y'all? Welcome to Just Facts with Bob Mata. Uh, excited to be here. It's been a little bit of a, a break in between. Uh, I was traveling. I had a lot of stuff going on. Always have a lot of stuff going on, but it's all for you guys. We've got some exciting things coming up in the future. Uh, and one of those things we're dealing with tonight and I'm not going to waste much time because uh, we've got Bill Dorsch again, which I'm really excited about. Uh, Bill is my partner in find. Get it? Get it? Because we're looking for more Gacy victims. So uh, Bill, as I've said in our last live, which was actually not live, but this is live, is in an undisclosed location somewhere in Europe, which means it's three in the morning and Bill I'm an old man, but Bill's a really, really old man. So he is up at about three in the morning. And uh, so I don't want to waste his valuable time when he should be getting his beauty sleep. Uh, but without further ado, let's bring Bill in. All right. Oh, look there. Oh, there's Bill. Bill. Oh, my God. There he is. Oh, my God. He's he's in his robe. <sighs> Tell me I'm dreaming, Bob. <laughs> Oh, uh, good morning, Bill. Let me gear up here. Yes, it is morning, and I, it's got to be a good one. Friend? I'm uh, I'm excited to have you on again, man. Um, <coughs> thank you for doing this. Uh, we we did it. We recorded last time early, and then we we played it uh, as basically a live, but it was really recorded. This one's actually live, which is cool because. As we're going through, if we get uh, questions, comments, uh, we will be able to put them up and have you answer. And uh, I like that interaction with our, our viewers because, uh, believe me, my friend, there are going to be a lot of people that have questions for us. So real quick primer, um, if you didn't see the first live, uh, this is Bill Dorsch, retired uh, Chicago police detective, homicide division, and uh, Bill's an amazing guy, uh, was an amazing cop. He's, as I said, retired <laughs> these days, uh, living the life of luxury, uh, taking trips to Greece all the time, making me always, always incredibly jealous that he's living the life that I hope to live someday. Uh, but it's well earned. And uh, more importantly, <laughs> Bill and I uh, connected over Gacy of all things, go figure. Uh, but Bill ran into the podcast. We soon realized that we were cut from the same cloth, kindred spirits, and we had the same goal of exposing, uh, secrets and lies and, uh, to try to help victims, families moving forward. So, and that's exactly what we we're planning on doing. So, uh, also we kind of talked about you know, Bill's history with Gacy in the last live. If you haven't watched it, we're not going to repeat it. Go back. It's right there for you. You can watch it. And uh, we started talking about how Bill became involved with the Gacy case. After Gacy's arrested, after Gacy's convicted, years, years later, really, 
And uh, I know, Bill, we were talking off off camera a little bit. Uh, you kind of want to jump into what led into the sham dig in 98 and really <laughs> what ended up kind of getting your, your juices flowing, got your, your mind turning and churning and wanting to, to do something about what you felt Chicago police and Cook County Sheriff had not done which is dig into this thing. And, you know, so why don't you tell the folks like leading into that, that sham dig in 98 by the Cook County Sheriff's police, what, you know, what occurred? Cause we got into a little bit in the last one, but not, not in the way that I think that you wanted to really kind of clarify for everybody. Right. Thanks, Bob. Uh, well, as we, I think we ended last uh, time with this, we had done the uh, first search of the property on Miami Avenue. And for the first time in my life, I had some evidence, potential evidence other than suspicion. That had to be brought now to the police, who I knew were not gonna be happy getting that information. Because like any government, city, uh, police department, they own some things in life. When you have dozens of missing children being reported and there's no solution for many years, people want to know why. And suddenly after years pass with so many people going missing that were related to Gacy through work, young boys, bodies are now being found and a man is identified as the offender, John Wayne Gacy. Okay, so now they can't hide what they didn't do. They can tell you what they did do, but there's so much they didn't do. And that's why they were fearful when I came forward with the scan information. I mean, if I would have, they all knew, like I knew, that suspicion alone is not enough to dig up a property. But now, they're required to follow the evidence if they believe in it. Now, I was just presenting the evidence of the scan through uh, through Ron LaBarca, Ron LaBarca and the BGA. And it was going to be up to the police to evaluate and make a decision on their next steps. I would have been done after these meetings that were to come up. Now, let's get into the meetings. So now we've told the police through Jim Froon, and Jim Froon was my ex-homicide, well, he was the detective commander of Area 5 in Chicago when I was assigned there as a homicide detective. Jim retired and set up his own private investigations company. More, He did more security work than investigations, but he did both. <clears throat> so Jim arranged the first meeting to be held at his offices, because I told Jim, we can't take this in, uh, into the Chicago Police Department office at Area 5, where I once worked, because I've been gone for four years now. And once I walk through the door, people are wanting to know, why is Bill Dorsch having meetings with these people in the back? What's going on? And I know the police department, sooner or later, somebody's going to cough it up. And that's something I didn't want. I wanted to keep it quiet, because I thought, you know, it's we don't really have no what we don't know if anything's there, so why make a big thing out of it? You know, right. we could do the search and walk. If there's nothing there, we're gonna walk away, but we've done it. We got the answer. If there's bodies there, wow, now we gotta be police. We have to be a police department and follow this up. <clears throat> so the first meeting is called at IFPC office. What's and that, Bill? For us that don't know what the yeah. I, you, uh, when you well, throw I, acronyms around, yeah, let us know uh, what they mean. <laughs> it, it was Jim Froon's acronym uh, for him in a partnership with another person. Okay. Uh, so uh, anyway, the first meeting is called, and it isn't at the police department. It's at Jim's offices in the edge of Chicago. And I expected uh, cooperation. I mean, most of the people that were coming here already knew my involvement with Gacy through many years of me being there working with them and telling them. So I have at the first meeting, um, 
It comes in John Thomas, who is a new commander of Area 5 detectives who followed Jim Froon years later to be the commander. A Lieutenant Ralph Barganski, he was there. Sergeant Frank Capitelli was there. Uh, and two detective friends of mine, Bob Rutherford and Ed Dickinson. So I'm also expecting the BGA to be there, the Better Government Association of Chicago, because they were working with me through the scan that we did. And <clears throat> so they were supposed to be there. And uh, I saw them there. And Jim Froon walked up to me and says, they're not supposed to be here. I said, what do you mean they're not supposed to be here? They've been a part of this whole thing. They're paying for Ryan LaBarca to come in, for Christ's sake. Well, downtown doesn't want them here. Well, downtown to me, a detective means, you know, the head of the police department, city hall, somebody down there doesn't like it. Okay. So I said, well, they're here. Okay. So I expected that they were going to be involved in the meeting. We, <clears throat> the meeting was uh, moved to the second floor conference room in the building where Jim's office is. And as I'm going up, I realize that Ron LaBarca, I mean, uh, that Mike Lyons, the investigator for the BGA, he's not coming with us. He's downstairs with Jim Froon and Rocky Rinaldi, who was a, a associate of Jim, who had been a sergeant in the police department. And he never comes up to the meeting. They kept him downstairs. So I walk into the conference room and I sit down with these people who are friends of mine. Like I said, I'm, I'm with them every day, not too long ago. And uh, even used to go golfing with Sergeant Capitelli, all right? And suddenly, uh, Frank Capitelli says to me, Bill, you're not going to name names, are you? And I said, right away, I knew what he meant. He was going to say, he was meaning, you're not going to mention the people you told this information about the site on Miami Avenue, are you? And I said, Frank, you know, of course not. There was no way that I had anything more than suspicion. So why bring them into this? All right. And we're all here now. I passed out a summary of uh, how I knew Gacy and gave that them to them for a review. And there were hardly any questions at that meeting after they looked at the, the four page summary. And I asked Frank, I said, what else? And he says, uh, who else knows you're here? And I said, well, Frank, uh, you know, every, you know, not uh, just my wife, my kids, you, you know, whoever you talk to. He says, what about the media? I says, whoa, a little too early for that, Frank. So he ended it. No questions. And they all walked out the door and said goodbye. And uh, never, never did they talk to Mike Lyons from the BGA. They just blew right past him out the door. And, uh, I was, I was astounded. I mean, I, I expected there had to be, even though I talked about John Gacy, this is something more about the scan. There was not one question about the scan yet. Right. All right. And so I went back and I sat in my office and Jim Froon quickly comes in and I said, is there a problem? He says, problem. They're afraid, Bill. They're afraid. I said, what are they afraid of? He says, they're afraid there's bodies there and they're going to have to answer questions. I says, Frank, again, repeating myself, all we had was suspicion. Right. But this I knew. We were going to have to have at least another meeting because we had not brought in the state's attorney's office yet. Okay. And they, were, they would have to be involved in any charging or any in approving the search warrant and so forth. And so we had a search uh, a second meeting scheduled. And, uh, I wanted to make sure that who was coming. So I called area five and I, I asked for Bob Rutherford, who was a detective friend of mine. And I said, uh, Bob, who's coming to the meeting? He says, Bill, they don't want you to come here. They don't want us to talk to you. I said, Whoa, you know, you know, what the hell's going on? You know, Bob, you know, this is a guy that used to go to my, I, I let him and his family use my cabin in Wisconsin for Christ's sake. And now suddenly I'm not even supposed to talk to you. You know, well, he says, I can't answer any questions. I'll see you at the meeting. Well, when the meeting uh, happens, uh, 
Thomas doesn't come. Bargansky doesn't come. It's just Sergeant Capitelli. They didn't invite the BGA. All right. But from the state's attorney's office was Anna Demacopoulos. Now, in my book, and I'm correcting this, I got her first name as Donna. I don't know why. <laughs> Donna. Well, at I, least you're correcting it here, Bill. Um, yeah, I'm going to correct it in the hardcover book. I, have, I haven't done that yet. She but sounds have, like a nice Greek gal. She a nice Greek she, gal? She was great. I worked with her in several of my homicide cases. When she walked through the door, I said, great, Donna's here. I mean, see, I get to Donna again. It's Anna. Okay. <laughs> I said, she's, she's here. We're going to go with this. And so we walked up to the conference room again. Jim Froon doesn't come up. Rocky Rinaldi, his assistant, doesn't come up. It's just Frank Capitelli, uh, Bob uh, Rutherford, and Eddie Dickinson, and Sergeant Capitelli, uh, Anna, and I. And I said, Anna, where would you like to start? And she says, I said, would you, I said, where do you, would you like to start? You want to start with the four page summary? Because I didn't know if she'd ever seen it before because, you know, I didn't know if she had it. And she looked at me and said, Bill, I've seen that bullshit. What I want to know is when did you call the sheriff's department and who did you talk to? Well, I said, whoa, you know, slow down. You know, and I said, hey, you know, that was, this is 1998. Gacy was arrested in 78, and I called them within days or a week or more after his arrest. I said, Donna, at the time that I called, I'm surely I knew the name of the person that answered the phone and gave him my information, but I no longer recall the name of that man. I said, it was more important for him to remember my name and my contact information than it was for me to remember his name, but I did know it at the time. Okay. So she settled down a little bit, but not very much. And she again said, Bill, if you don't tell me who you called and when you called, I'm not going to believe you. And I, we're not going to go anywhere with this. And I said, I can't, I can't do it. There's no way in hell. I'm not going to make up a name for you. All right. I don't have the, the, the person's name. All I can tell you is that I know it was a man that I talked to. Uh, so I mean, but why is she sweating you on like some dude? Well, she, I, I, I realized already, you know, I said they're afraid of, of uh, the bodies and having to reopen the case and the criticism that's going to come for their inaction. I mean, the inaction was the Chicago Police Department. They handled the missing person reports, Okay. The sheriff's department came in after the arrest, okay? But she was there to send me a message, all right? And uh, she was there only to deter me in, in going further and to shut me up, all right? She was going to walk out that door and nothing was going to be done. Because, I mean, at this point, you're basically the only guy 20 years after the fact that's squawking about Gacy and additional yeah. victims, right? I mean, like, at that point in time, no one else is talking about it. No one else is trying to do anything about it. You know, everybody's like, Chicago PD, Cook County is all like, look, man, the guy, now the guy's been executed. He's in the ground four years yeah. running now. Like, what? Like, why are you, why are you digging up old shit? And you're like, well, because families deserve to know, right? I mean, I mean, and it's like, and you can feel the resistance immediately. I mean, you're a trained homicide detective. You know how to read a room. It doesn't, you know, and like you're getting the vibe immediately after the first meeting that, look, you're, you're getting brick walls are, are being put up in front of you like while you're sitting there watching it happen and, and you can feel that that momentum that you had going from the scan and knowing, yeah. look, man, now I've, I've got stuff happening. I've got some proof. There's, there's anomalies in the soil that warrant us going over there and seeing what the hell's going on in this, in this, in this earth, man. And, and so you, you go into the second thing and, and they're, they're sending people in to give you static 
and asking you to name names about things that are really irrelevant anyway. <laughs> you know, what, whatever you said 20 years ago, how is that relevant to what, you know, what you've got in front of them now? You know what I'm saying? Like from right. your perspective, you must have been like, man, what the hell? You know? Yeah. But, you know, after Gacy's arrest and kids are being identified, some of the families sued, successfully sued the police department for, I don't know, criminal would be malfeasance, I guess, but inaction. Okay. And they won those lawsuits. So I'm sure the city, like I've done a lot of wrongful conviction cases too. Uh, finding somebody innocent and, I mean, exonerating someone, there's usually a follow-up of a civil lawsuit that results in money. For sure. You know, how much is the day of your life worth? You know, so people who spent 20 years in jail, you know, expect uh, justice. Yeah. And and so that's what they are afraid of. They were there. There's the, always the money issue when it comes to finding something wrong with the police departments. Right. Okay. And so they were very fearful of that, plus reputations were involved. And I didn't know anything about the backdoor stuff. I mean, uh, Jim Froon, <clears throat> after he took the information from the scan to the police department, he was so excited. He was talking about, I'm going to get jackets with my IFPC, my company logo on the back. When we dig up that property, he's jumping way ahead on me. We're going to go. I'm going to have my people there in jackets, you know, so they're going to see my company name and, and, and this and that. And suddenly the guy that encouraged me to find information that resulted in the radar scan that we did is now backing away from me. Like he was never involved. Right. And, you know, this is a guy that I had a good relationship with, you know, he never, when I was a detective working on a heater homicide case, like many good detectives did, uh, I don't recall him ever walking out of the front office and asking me or anybody else to see our notes on the case we're working at. But suddenly, uh, after that second meeting, uh, he, he wants my files. All right. Right. And I said, hey, Jim, all I've got is the four pages that, that I've been talking about for four years. I mean, for 20 years already, you know, and uh, nothing more than that. But he was, you know, he wanted to know everything. And he's having now, he's having meetings, and I'm not involved. After that second meeting, I'm not involved with anybody. But at the end of that second meeting, after my friends walked out the door without even saying goodbye, all right, uh, I went in the office and called Ron LaBarca because they had, Donna had called, excuse me, let me go back. After we walked out of the second meeting, Donna, I think you saying Donna, it's Anna Demacopoulos. <laughs> I mean, Demacopoulos, I'm even getting Right, I mean, none of us care, but Donna yeah. or Anna might care. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah, they're right. similar. Anyway, she, after that, she walked out, she and Frank Capitelli, they went into my office and they called Ron LaBarca and had about a 20-minute conversation with him. And then they left. OK, well, then I went in and I called Ron right away and he says, what's their problem, Bill? I says, I, I said, man, the, I don't know what's going on here. He says she was very he says, I expected I was going to come back to Chicago to help. And I was eager to do so. And I wanted to convey my information. But she was unbelievable to deal with. He says she was telling me on the phone, if you can't tell me that you're 100% certain that we're going to find bodies on that property. We're not going to dig. And right. he says, I, like I've told you and everybody else, you, you, yeah, you have to dig, but the anomalies are only an indication that a body might be there, but you have to dig to be sure. Anything less than that would be wrong. It would be an action. Okay. So now that, uh, we're, I'm sort of lingering now. It's, days are starting to go by. Jim Froon's not talking to me until one day I come in and uh, he says, I want you to meet somebody in my office. So I walk into the office and there in front of me is a, he introduces me to a guy named, uh, what, what was his name? Uh, O'Brien. Tim O'Brien. I think it was Tim. He was a, a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. 
okay? And I right away, I said, oh, God, we're trying to keep this quiet. And here you bring in a news reporter, and you want me to talk to him. So I wanted to find out how much he had talked to him because I realized that Jim had spent about an hour with him in the office already. And I sat down with the guy and he's grilling me for questions. And the one question, the one thing I wouldn't give him is the location of the property. Okay. But he assured me, like all newspaper people do, that this won't go in the paper until we get an okay from your company and you. All right. I said, yeah, right. Well, anyway, it didn't take but a day before I get a phone call, not from Jim Froon. <laughs> all right. But Good from his Jim wife. Froon. <laughs> but for, but yeah, like I said, this had been a friend of mine. I mean, I worked for him, yeah. But we had a good relationship. But I'm getting the phone call not from Jim. I'm getting this phone call from his wife, Gloria, who's never called me before. <clears throat> and when I was working for Jim, he wouldn't hesitate to call you in the middle of the night when he needed something. All right. But I said, yeah, what's going on? He said, she says, well, Bill, Jim is downtown with a meeting. And He's tied up in a meeting, but he called me and he wants me to tell you that the story about the Miami Avenue address is going to be in the newspaper tomorrow morning. I said, right away, I said, Gloria, we don't want that. That's not what we want. That's not good. It's too early for any story. That's not good for Jim's company, Jim and me. And she said, oh, Bill, Jim and the company are not going to be in the story. It's you. Now I realize I'm alone in this. Yeah. I'm alone in this. And when I picked up the newspaper early that morning, because obviously I was very anxious, it was already on the radio and television. Uh, and I'm reading, Bill Dorsch, retired detective, is talking about bodies at a lo location in Chicago. Why didn't he tell anybody before when he was a detective? <laughs> you know, old, old Bill under the bus, baby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, drive me to the bank, give me an empty gun, tell me you're waiting in the car, and suddenly <laughs> I'm all alone. That's right. And that's what happened. Yeah. That's, yeah. So, you know, um, I know cooperation has gone out the door, right? So now I, I, I figure the only people I can trust, and this is important here. See, if it was only Bill Dorsch, retired detective, talking about the scanner, they would have said, yeah, bye, Bill. But the BGA, the Better Government Association, was there with me. That's who they couldn't run away from. Right. All right. So now they're caught with a problem. They have to review this evidence, and they have to pretend, at least, or to work with us, to engage us. Right. And find out what we have, which I expected a legitimate investigation would be. You find out what you have. And then you make decisions. Of course, the decision process is theirs, not mine. I'm done. They have to talk to Ron LaBarca, who's the expert. Bill Dorsch isn't the expert. I was only the messenger. Right. Okay. And suddenly, I realized with Ron telling me what he did, that maybe I should dig into this a little bit more. I mean, I had given... Uh, in that meeting, I gave them the names of several people that should be interviewed. In particular, Bruno Musinski and his wife, Lynn, who lived in that basement apartment, only to find out that years later, they didn't talk to him. But when they re-engaged with me in 98, they did call Lynn. Bob Rutherford called Lynn on the phone. And when I talked to her, she said, Bill, I wanted to give my information to the police. I was willing to go back to the Miami address and show them where they should dig. But they didn't want that information from me. All they wanted to know from me was, when did you live in the apartment? And she says, I don't remember exactly the year that I moved in, but I know when we moved out. And she says, well, all he kept telling me was, well, when you find out when you moved in, we want to know. And I says, but she said, isn't it kind of strange? They don't want my help. They just want to know when I lived there. And so I'm seeing this. The red flags are going up all over the place. And, yeah, I mean, uh, they're clearly trying to discredit the story. I mean, they're yeah. working actively not to investigate, but to discredit right. the story, discredit the people that you've spoken to. They're going to say, look, these people didn't even live in the apartment when Gacy was there. What would they know? You know what I mean? You can see 
that they're they're doing everything that they can to stop. And, and I just want to be clear in in like for people that might be joining late or didn't see the first, you know, the first uh, live that we did, well, quasi live, it, you know, what Bill and I are, are looking to do here, um, boots on the ground, is, is we are going to be out doing what should have been done in 98. And then what? when did, when did they do the second sham dig? <laughs> like they did another another sham dig, right, in 2002? Well, or... well, that yeah, that was the 2011-2012. Yeah. Because, so, I mean, and it was the same thing though, you, you know, where you get, yeah, but, but this time, Bob, at the first, the first dig, uh, it, because they made the location known, there were thousands of people on the street kept right. back by police barricades, a big wooden fence around the property. So you couldn't see into the yard front yard. And then they did their reported dig inside of tent. Right. The second search involved the FBI. I've got that report too. Okay. Right. And, uh, and uh, that was done in, I think it was February, very cold conditions yet in Chicago, not a good time to be digging up ground uh, with the presence of three or four search dogs trying to sniff. What they did was in their report, they took a drill and they drilled a hole into the parking lot asphalt and then brought a dog up and they even put the time for how long the dog sniffed all right i don't think the longest sniffer was about a minute but none of the dogs uh, identified a body okay which is we're looking for a body that's 25 years old already and Very we're talking about so is Close this and weather is, right but but not only that so so this is they were trying to search that area the area that we know about where Gacy was known to have, like when he was repaving the no, parking but, lot. Well, like Ron LaBarca being sent to the airport, we're not present, so we don't know exactly where they were. On the right, property. I mean, like, like we know of an area based on your oh, yeah. interviews in that parking lot where Gacy had dug a six-foot hole that somebody saw oh, a, a yes. person of Hispanic yes. heritage in that hole. And we have no idea whether or not they drilled hot number one, how, how deep they drilled exactly, nor whether or not they drilled in the right area. You know, I mean, uh, the point being we have, we're 20 years after the fact and bill you're in Europe. Now. I don't know. Like I've told you about, they finally got somebody on the long Island serial killer, the Gilgo beach stuff. This, this Hewerman guy who, by the way, gives me a massive Gacy vibe. He really does in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Professional guy was like married, had a kid, you know, but he was a super creep. You know, he appears to yeah. be, he appears to be the guy. He hasn't been convicted yet. Obviously he's presumed innocent, but in terms of what they've been able to collect in terms of evidence, it, it seems like a very strong probable cause affidavit, even though it wasn't really a PCA in New York, they did what's called a bond application and, and what would have otherwise been had he not been indicted by a grand jury going into that, it would have been the probable cause affidavit. It's strong. They did a lot of police work, a lot of the same Gacy type vibes in terms of the investigation that had gone on previously with Hewerman and the difference between what's going on now with Rex Hewerman and what went on with Gacy after he's arrested in 78 is the contrast that I want people to be aware of. Like, like everywhere that they know that Hewerman has been, you know, they've, they've been digging in a anywhere that they they've been able to put missing persons in areas where he was known to have been at a certain time frame. They're digging into those cases. What, and, and I'm talking about out of New York, I'm talking about in Vegas and I'm talking about yeah. down in South Carolina and anywhere, Jersey, right. and, you know what I mean? And none of that, None of that took place with Gacy. Right. No, like nothing yeah. like that took place after Gacy. It was contained to the house and yeah. what they dug up on the property and the river. And that was it. Right. There was and no investigation beyond that ever of any kind. And in 16 months, I killed more people. 16 months later, he's on trial. Unbelievably quick. With, 33 with, victims. With, with like at that point, near half not identified you know they go they go to trial with john does you know they don't even know the names of these kids 
and they're going right. to trial. And, you know, obviously my father's a part of that thing, but, you know, so that frustration and, and when I started the podcast, I didn't realize until I started digging in what you had known for, for 20 years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, you had known the failure by Chicago police department and cook County Sheriff in terms of a lack of any kind of investigation of what this guy may have done yeah. in the years that they consider him to have been dormant. And, you know, those are the years 72 to 75. Now we, and look, we've talked about this. I tend to think like you're, you're, you're in the same camp that my father is. You don't think that he was, he was killing in Iowa. You think that he kind of became a killer in prison that, that he, at that point, whatever happened to him in there, got him to the point where when he gets out, he's then killing. I'm of a different mindset. We re, we agree to disagree on that. Um, yeah. I, I just, I tend to think that, that he would, he'd already slipped into that mode. Uh, and I base it on the stories that, that, I've heard and the people that I've spoken to in terms of what he was doing in Waterloo to these kids, including the one that he ends up getting arrested for. And it's, it's exactly like what he was doing, what his MO was when he was killing like to, to a T, you know, now, I mean, obviously serial killers build up to the point where they finally pull the trigger and, and kill somebody, you know, but it, it seemed like, he had been building up, you know, prior to the arrest to the <clears> point where I think it warrants us to take a trip and yeah. dig around a little oh, bit. Yeah. You we, know, you and I, I've shared with you some locations that were never talked about, never identified, but I only through interviews that I have done, have they been pointed out to me yeah. and there's significant reason and information to go back there and really take a look. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to do it and we're doing right. it and we're going to do it. And so, and you know, and I just want to get it out there for people. Cause like people will be watching this live, but there's going to be people that watch this on replay. And since our first one aired, I've had, and I wanted to kind of, I meant to tell you before we got live, but, and I, and I don't know how our, our feeling is going to be mutually about this, but I had a, a current cook County, uh, deputy sheriff reach out to me. Uh, I'm not going to name him here live, but I, I'm going to want to tell you this offering his assistance. Now we, <laughs> who says that he wants to help us in any way that he can, you, you know, we've got the issue of Moran who I don't think is going to be helping us or wanting to help us. And he, and he's really the guy for the Cook County yeah. Sheriff's yeah. Pass that is the one that is, kind of heading the the identification process of these five still identi unidentified victims. So I, I have concerns about that. But, you know, the bigger thing is, is that both of us been contacted by multiple people about people that had gone missing back in that time frame, not only from Chicago, but I've got I've got multiple people from Iowa um, that were on that same route as Timothy McCoy was. and. You know, it's one of those things where people want to know, you know, I mean, people, oh, yeah. family members that don't know where they're going. So, Bill, there's some feedback going on. I don't know if it's on your end. I hear it, too. Say something. Uh, I'm, I'm right with you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So are you guys hearing it on Bill's part or are you hearing it on both of our parts? So. You think it might be on Bill's end? Okay, it's probably my movement. I was just pouring some coffee. Maybe that was it. I don't know. All right, maybe. Uh, maybe Are you still right? hearing it? We can hear you, but you sound bad. So what I'm going to do? Uh, I want you to log back off and log back on to see if we can get a better connection. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to pull you out of the room and then just follow that same link. Like okay. jump off and jump back on and see if we can fix the connection. Good do, sir. All right, and check your check your connection with the mic because it did seem to coincide when you picked up that coffee cup. Okay. Did you put a phone near something? Is your phone near any of the equipment? No, my phone is away from it. Well, yeah. 
Maybe I should turn it up. All right, but here, log back off and log back on. I will do so. I'll kill time until you come back. Okay. All right. Okay, so while Bill's off, um, we'll get him back on. So, as you guys know, uh, the Hewerman thing had a development today. Uh, one of the, the the lawyer who's representing the the victims, uh, this attorney John Ray, had his own press press conference. I was going to cover it, um, but I was talking to Joe uh, Jacalone, who, by the way, uh, I'm going to be having on live on Monday. And what my dream is, and, and it's hard with Bill because it is three in the morning where he's at, is that I want to get Joe and Bill on, my two favorite cops, my two favorite retired homicide detectives on the same stream, because I want to be able to compare and contrast for people um, exactly what the failures were in Gacy and why Bill and I are so adamant about doing what we're about to do and compare it to what they're doing with Hewerman because Hewerman's what should have been done with Gacy, which didn't get done. And Bill and I are both of the mindset that there are additional victims and that we have enough evidence of that, that we're going to be able to push law enforcement and bully them into doing what should be done. Now, Bill's been trying to do it for a long, long time. And you know, when he ran into my podcast, uh, we had a, an immediate bond in terms of us both wanting to advocate for victims. And it's our intention uh, to see this through to the very bitter end. And and if we end up going and, and digging up the properties that we believe that there's going to be additional victims and there's nothing there, well, there's nothing lost. Um, and, and we'll be able to sleep better at night knowing that we did what we could in order to try to help these families out that have been missing their kids and their loved ones for 40 plus years. Um, you know, I mean, we live in an age now that, uh, you know, there is no cold case anymore. Not really. Uh, there is no such thing. Um, you know, it may be a case that's long on the tooth, but for, for loved ones and family members, it's certainly not cold. You know, it's, it's a, a case that lives on in their minds and their hearts forever. So, um, you know, and if we're in a position to try to help people and, uh, Bill and I can do what we can. All right, Bill's back. Let's see if we got him. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay. Bill speaketh. Uh, I'm okay. I think. Oh, you sound great. Idea. Good. Okay. Good. That worked. That worked. Yeah. Brent, uh, this is right. I'm going to show this one. That's correct. That is, uh, that is, that is a quote allegedly. Now we got the cop that had said that if you listen to our pod, um, you know, we got that same cop that was Tovar bill. The one right. who, so the Tovar right. is the one with the 45 sounds like a good number quote. Obviously, that's coming through Tovar. Um, seems like a weird thing to lie about from Tovar's right. perspective. But, I mean, there was a lot of like a lot of clout grabbing that was going on with all the cops that were involved in that yeah, case. That's not unusual. Usually, it's the bosses who are grabbing it. But, uh, right. uh, you know, I have no criticism of the Des Plaines police officers. I, I, I mean, Neither. they they did a fantastic job. And Tovar was... Tovar was the only one of them that was assigned to work with the sheriff's department when they took it away from Des Plaines, okay? And uh, like, like them, Chicago only had one investigator that was assigned to assist. Massive case involving Chicago. They only assigned one detective right. to help with the investigation. Right. Anyway. So Yeah, no, I mean, look, I, I was very protective of, of the boots on the ground guys for displaying PD, you know, um, the guys that were all kind enough to come onto the podcast and frankly disclosed, you know, never before heard information to me. I, I, I really wanted to protect those guys because, you know, they, they, you know, they really kind of went above and beyond in terms of giving me information that they hadn't given anybody else. And frankly, the guy, you know, Cozen Zach was really a lone wolf. And, and I heard that from a, like, like a ton of these guys, you, you know, I mean, every, every guy that was boots on the ground, their, their, their thing about Cozen Zach, who was the guy who orchestrated the, 
you know, the receipt getting injected into the evidence was that he was doing it alone. Maybe, maybe Ron Adams knew about it, but Ron is also deceased, you know, and, and I wasn't really willing to put Ron on, you know, on blast in terms of, you know, I mean, following the breadcrumb trail, I, I could see that Ron was the one that, that, Kozenzak was sending Ron was Ron Adams was the guy that he sent to Nissan that day on the 19th to go check the logbook to verify that that somebody namely Kim Byers had actually turned in film either on uh the the 10th or the 11th when Rob went missing either the day before or the day of and you know he sends Ron Adams over there Ron's the one who grabs the book brings it back to the police station they make photocopies. They keep the actual logbook, but they return the, you know, the copies of the pages to the the pharmacy so they can give people their pictures when they come to pick them up, you know. And like Ron seemed to be the one guy that if Cozen Zach was going to confide in in terms of what he was doing, that it would have been Ron. But you know, I mean, when you're doing something like that, you want to keep it as close knit as possible because more the more people that know about it the greater oh, the yeah. damage that somebody's oh, going to talk gosh. about something, whether it For be, sure. to, yeah, especially a case like that, you know, you get somebody like, Oh my God, you get it. Like somebody tells their wife in confidence and their wife's at the beauty shop, you know, and she just, it's an amazing story. So she lets slip and then it's out there once, once the thing's out there and then the story gets bastardized and it gets, you know, it's like the old phone, you know, the, the phone game, when you telephone game, you play with a group of kids you know, you start with whispering one thing in one kid's ear, and by the time it makes its way around 15 kids, the the story is completely different than the original story. But it's a it's a it's an actual microcosm of what goes on with any kind of rumor or story that gets out there, especially in a case like that. So while you were off, I was explaining. You know, I I, I keep wanting people to kind of understand that you know, what, what has us so adamant about doing what we're going to be doing is the fact that like, like we've got this example with this Rex Huerman. The reason that I keep bringing him up is, is because it's, that's what should have happened with Gacy, the investigation that they're doing into everywhere that they knew that this guy visited everywhere that this guy traveled every, you know, and then what they're doing is they're saying, okay, we know that this guy was in Nevada during this time frame, were there any people that went missing during that time frame? And then they're investigating it. Same with like his property that his brother owns down in South Carolina, you know, and they're, and they're stuck with the same, the same issues. You know I mean? They, they have the advantage now of being able to have DNA. And if they had DNA from a scene back then, they can, they can obviously get profiles and try to get matches. They didn't have that back in the day, but it doesn't excuse them for doing nothing. Because right. Gacy, the one and, thing that you know, Bill, is Gacy said he always kept immaculate business records everywhere yeah. that he traveled to. We're going to know, you know. Yes. And very important also, um, looking for bodies that may be a part of the total. Um, what was amazing to me, you had people that were identified as victims, like a couple boys from Michigan. Right. All right. You would expect not just a phone call from the Chicago Police Department and saying, oh, we identified your son as a victim. You would expect investigators running out there to talk to them about because it's so important to find out all you can. Who was the last person to see the kid alive? Right. Why was exactly. he in Chicago? You know, that kind of information. They never, ever question. The, those families, they only delivered a message. We found your son's body. Come and get him. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. You know, you know and like, it's like I say, if you don't ask, you don't get the answer. That yeah, for certain, like you 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 can't get the answer. You know, and they're like beyond that. There's going to be people that, for whatever reason, may not have made a police report. People that may not have reported the kid missing. You know, but there's people that did and then never got any kind of follow up. You know, like when I started the podcast and I know he's reached out to you, he, he's a avid fan of the podcast. And I think he's an avid Bill Dorsch fan as well. Brian Rausch. And he had a family member, uh, a kid named John Deeney that went missing. Um, 
back right around 72, 73, early, like right when Gacy would have been starting to get active. And John Deeney took the exact same route that Tim McCoy had. Tim McCoy was the same deal, man. Like Tim McCoy got snatched up at the Greyhound bus station, which is where early on Gacy did his prowling. Right. You know, he would look for these wide eyed kids getting off a bus that were in route somewhere else. Typically it was either uh, up to Michigan or Minnesota. Like Tim McCoy had come back to Iowa for what would have been his, his high school class graduation to, you know, celebrate with his old buddies had taken the Greyhound there and was on his way back when he went missing. Right. And, you know, kind of like what I ended up, and I, like I told you about the Lucy Studi thing that I've been working on, right? And she's mm-hmm. the gal out in Iowa. And I don't know if I ever told you this story, but like the story like cemented for me that I'm like, I was supposed to have met you. I was supposed to have started this podcast in order to meet you. And, and like, like, however I got involved with Lucy Studi. So I was boots on the ground there. You know, when they were doing a, what I consider to be a sham dig initially. And I have this conversation. I'm up on this this berm, like on this, you know, like it's farmland that you wouldn't expect in Iowa. And it's in this area called Green Hollow. And like I had like climbed up this big, like craggy, giant, like mud wall to get up on top of this berm in order to get on top of this this huge kind of like foothill to try to look over this property line to see what the cops are doing, because I had promised Lucy that I was going to try to see what they were doing. She wanted to know if they were digging in the right well. And I'm like, I can't see them. So I, I have the occasion that they had put, they knew I was there. All right. Cause I was posting live TikToks and they're like all, like all the cops knew I was there. They were like calling me the TikTok guy. Yeah. You're like, Oh, you're the TikTok guy. We're watching you. You know, we know, we know. I'm like, well, yeah, you're watching me. I'm like, I'm not hiding what I'm doing. I'm, I'm here, you know? So, but I, I talked to this, this, uh, this cop, real nice guy, sheriff, you know, and, and we're sitting there shooting the shit for like an hour, you know, while I'm just kind of standing up on this property line. He was posted there to watch for me, to make sure that I wasn't sneaking over. So we're having this conversation and naturally it gets to the point where, and at this point I had been talking to Lucy for massive amounts of time, like telephonically for hours and hours on end. She knew all about the Gacy stuff. She knew all about my father representing him. She knew that I had done the, you know, the podcast and, you know, so I'm talking to this, this old deputy sheriff and he says, and when Gacy comes up, he's oh yeah, he's like yeah, you know, uh, he's like Gacy's first first victim, Tim McCoy. I'm like yeah, it, he's like he was from Green Hollow. I'm like what? He's like yeah, he was from right here. He's like he's like a distant cousin of of the Studies. So it, like my mind exploded. I'm like, are you telling me that the first Gacy victim was actually a like a blood relative of? Lucy Studi, the person which this this case that I'm working on, <laughs> trying to 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 get these victims out of the ground, if if we're to believe what she says is true, and he's like, yeah, hundred percent. So I cut. So like my mind is like exploding. I'm like, I can't like, cause that. What are the odds of that? Number yeah, one, for sure. You know, and, and at that point, you and I are already in conversations about doing what we need to do. As a matter of fact, I think that we have may we may have snuck on and done our scan. Like after I find this information out, like we may have gone back to to the the property and gotten on and did our scan. And so I I get on the phone with Lucy and I'm like, are are, are you related to Tim McCoy? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, like, you didn't think to suggest to me that like, because I found it so incredibly small world that it was impossible for it not to be fate that I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, Mm -hmm. like out of all the like. The fact that I was working on that case and ended up like on that hill, like in like in person, boots on the ground, and then to have that conversation to find that information out just really blew my mind. And, and it, it and it put me on this thing, like, man, like we like we got to do this. You know what I mean? Like this is this is a thing that that we have to do because 
I feel that it's like my purpose in life is to get this thing done. So, you know, it's a crazy story and it's a hundred percent true, you know, and I verified, I mean, the fact that the kid was the first victim, but he had taken the same trip that that kid, John Dini did. And, you know, so Brian Roush had reached out to me and they had done a comparison of what, they think that he would have looked like in terms of John Deeney. And it's one of the victims that they put together from, uh, they did a, like a computer recreation of what they think mm -hmm. that the yes. victim would have looked like from his skeletal remains. And, and man, I'll send it to you. It's, it's like, it's stunning. So when I went to Moran with it, you know, Moran's like, Oh no, we already looked at that one. Uh, we checked him off the list. You know, and I'm not afraid to say it on a live and Moran may run into it, but like, I don't believe them. I like, I, I just, it's, they look so similar that we'll, to me. We'll, we'll talk about Moran too. Like, yeah, I you know, so I mean, like there, there's a lot. So, all right, let's, let's try to talk a little bit about, so after, after these two, if you want to call them meetings, which clearly were you know, to, to, to extract whatever information you knew, find out how limited the reach was in terms of who you talked to, to see how far they had to go with this thing. You know, what, what, what leads into them actually finally doing what we refer to as the sham dig? Well, they, they, like I said, the reason they had to do it was the BGA. That was obvious to me. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think it was uh, a pr our previous mayor. Uh, what was his name? Emmanuel, Rahm Emanuel. Yeah. Uh, don't waste a, 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 a bad opportunity. You know, if something bad happens, turn it around. If right. You can. And right. so what they did was they, they, the best defense is a good offense. So they put out the projection that, okay, we really don't want to do this. We don't really trust why Bill Dorsch didn't tell us about this so many years ago, and but we have to do it. So they put out this um, impression that they're going to do an honest, legitimate search of the property. And like I said, the day that they did the, the search, there were thousands of people. There were re hundreds, uh, maybe 100 reporters or helicopters in the sky, cameras on rooftops around the Miami address. You know, they gave the perception of doing police work, a legitimate search. Only what they were doing in front of everybody was a great shell game. You know, the ball was missing. Nobody was really looking for it. And nobody was asking questions after they announced, we searched the property. We found nothing. We're done with this location. And then they said, we're, we're done with the location. And I didn't see them walking away from it, Bob. I saw them running away from that location. Right. They couldn't get out of there fast enough. But right. what can I do? You know, basically, now uh, I'm alone. Jim Froon is long ago uh, dropped out of the picture. Matter of fact, he, him and uh, Rocky Rinaldi didn't even show up at the dig site on the day of the dig. Okay. They were in the office with me. I was so surprised when I walked in that they were there. Because, you know, I, you would expect that he would be at the site. And after that, he didn't talk to me for at least a week. You know, he went out of town. And then when he came back, he said to me, Bill, are you done with this bullshit? And I said, done with the bullshit? I said, you mean what we did? He says, yeah. I says, well, yeah, if you mean, am I unhappy with the way it turned out and you guys trashed my reputation and hung it all on me? I'm done. All I want to do is put it behind me. And I wanted to convey that message to this city because I didn't know what I was going to do. And I had to protect my two sons on the police department. I mean, the second threat that came, came from Radke and he's dead now. Uh, but I got to talk about it. Uh, through, he, he was the chief, uh, the first deputy, second most powerful in the police department. He had called Jim Froome, and Froome came into my office and told me 
uh, you better be careful. You got two kids on the job. One of them uh, could be gone today because he's in the uh, training academy and we'll put a brick on your other kid and he'll never go anywhere. I said, but I said, Jim, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to do anything more. And I knew my time with Jim Froon working at his office was going to be very short after that. Okay. And so after that, I left, went back to Wisconsin. Uh, I went, I went up to Wisconsin and tried to put it all behind me because, you know, alone, you don't have any power, you know? Right. And so for years after that, I, I, didn't really have anything or interest in following it up. And then years later, when I had returned to Chicago and started working as a private investigator on my own, I suddenly became engaged again through some news um, interviews that I had done and some articles that were written when suddenly I get a phone call from a Mrs. Marino. Okay. Sherry Marino. And I recognize her name immediately when she called because I knew one of Gacy's victims was 14-year-old Michael Marino. All right. He had disappeared in 1976 in October. Oh, boy, we're real close to the day that he disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she had reported him missing back in 76, and he disappeared that same day with his friend, Kenny Parker. And Mrs. Marino, she changed my life because she changed my thinking after I talked to her and found out what she had gone through. It totally changed my thinking about the John Wayne Gacy case. Up until that point, I, I thought, well, we're just trying to protect people in the police department in the city who don't want to face up to their inadequacy and the fact that they didn't do an investigation. That's what I thought I was facing. Right. Okay? But when I heard Mrs. Marino tell me what she endured, I mean, it, it just blew my mind. And this poor woman, 30 years later, when she's talking to me about her son missing and what she went through, was a story that, that my wife was sitting there with me. And I, I just couldn't believe, well, the anguish is still present in her. I mean, she was sitting in my home with her daughter, and her body was so limp and her actions, it was like somebody just walked in and told her, hey, we just found your son dead. Right. She's living this every day. And she's telling me that she doesn't believe the police department. I mean, and the medical examiner and the state's attorney. She doesn't believe anybody. They called her after Gacy was arrested. I mean, after Gacy was convicted and told her that they had found her son's body. I mean, they didn't find her son's body, that they identified the body. OK, and she didn't believe it. But that story is I want to give you great detail on this because I've I've met with her several times and the information she gave. The people who are going to listen to this are not going to believe. The length that a police department will go through to shut someone up. When they think they're a threat to them. Right. And Mrs. Marino is one mother, one mother out of 33 known bodies found and yet unknown victims that we don't haven't found yet. All right. And like her, a lot of these mothers now they're all are past. Well, Mrs. Marino is still alive, thankfully, but she's gone through trauma every day, every birthday, every holiday, every, everything she's missed with her son. You could feel it. And that absence is, is hung on her. Right. And I'm, I imagine for a lot of the mothers, they went through the same thing. 100%. And I want to get the answers to these people. They should know uh, if there were accomplices helping yeah. Gacy. Right. All right. They should know where other bodies were found. And if there were accomplices and the police knew about it, why weren't they charged? Yeah. Okay. So we've got that connection. And we can explain all that. And you and I are going to do that. Yes, we are. Yes, so. we are. And, you know, as far as like the, the known, the two known guys, obviously, David Cram and Michael Rossi. Cram hung himself uh, 
probably about 15 years back at this point in a, in a forest preserve, right. which I found unusual. Michael Rossi is alive. And oddly, uh, Michael Rossi, when I first, when I, when I was bringing the podcast out and I had reached out to some Chicago media and I let them know that I was doing it and I had, uh, I forget who it was. I forget it. It was a, it was a dude from GN who did like a five minute, like promotional piece came out to the house, did all the video. He's like, Oh, you got to give me a bunch of sound from the tapes. I'm like, here, here's a bunch of sound from the tapes. And it, like a lot of what I had given him was Gacy talking about Rossi, you know, yeah. like, Oh yeah. Rossi was digging the ditches. Yeah. Ro Rossi was asleep on the couch when, uh, you know, Zick was dead in the hallway and, you know, so when they're getting the final thing done, he comes back to me and this is 40 plus years later. And like you and I will get into why Rossi was protected back then. And why Rossi, when you talk about, I see talk, people talking about killer clown, the books, like, like they use pseudonyms right. for Michael Rossi in those books. And I'm wondering, you know, like what, what the hell? What, why is this guy getting protected? Like what? Like what are they not naming this guy for? When we have like actual statements of him being present, of him digging ditches, and you know there were so many stories that existed of kids that were what I consider to be Gacy survivors that Gacy had picked up. He'd started doing his creepy shit immediately in the car, like you know being incredibly inappropriately you know sexually suggestive to these kids like who aren't like kids street kids you know that are, right. are out there trying to hustle to survive right but but normal kids that are out there that are living at home that are just trying you know but this right. is back when hitchhiking was a thing like you know if you're young yeah. out there and you don't know what hitchhiking is that was a thing it's where you stuck your thumb up and you'd pick up or, you know, you'd pick up a, you know, a kid who needed a ride or a stranger and you'd give him a lift if it was on your way and they'd go on their merry way. And, and like, so Gacy would pick up a lot of kids like this, you know, and, and like, you would not believe how many people came to me after the fact with Gacy stories. Now, you know, I try to vet them to make sure that they're true. Like, you right. know, I, I wasn't putting them all on the pod because I like some of them I vetted and like, I knew when they had their dates wrong that they may have been full of shit, you know, but there were, there were plenty that I did vet and it was always the same story. Gacy would do what he would do. He'd make a kid super uncomfortable and that kid would wait till a red light, open the door and jet like gone. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. and it happened all the time. And Many of these kids, three of them that I spoke to, said that Gacy was in the backseat. Yes. And that he had yes. a younger guy up front driving. You know, and, and, and like, obviously, we know about Jeff Rignall, you know, the one of the survivors that went through three days of hell being tortured by Gacy constantly being chloroformed in and out of yes. consciousness, you know, burned, beaten, raped, like everything imaginable. This guy survives and he's absolutely confident that there were two people doing it to him. Right. You know, and, and like one of them was a young guy with dark brown hair is what he said. You know, he wakes up and some guy's performing fellatio on him while this guy's, you know, passed out and he comes to, and then they're, guy had like Rignall had chloroform burns all over his face, you know, and like Rignall goes to Chicago police. I mean, he's another example of the indifference by the Chicago police department to the point where he's like, this guy like tortured me and raped me for days and then lets me out where he picked me up naked in the middle of the city. You know, and, and he remembers what Gacy's car looks like. Right. So what he does is he sits on a bypass, an overpass, waiting for weeks for Gacy's vehicle to drive by again. But he had to do it on his own. He That's had, what I'm saying. I mean, the police should have been there. All right. Yeah. But they, they didn't do it. He had to go and catch Gacy himself and identify him. 
And they still told him, well, we're not going there. I, you know, but I mean, it, it's as unbelievable. Far as, uh, as, like, far as Michael Rossi, I want to get into that. Yes, yeah. he's still alive and he's, I'm not going to say where he's living. I know where he's living. Okay. People have told me, Bill, aren't you afraid of libel? You know, mentioning his name. I said, well, Joe Kozensack, Terry Sullivan, they were afraid. They changed his name in a book, but he was well known to be involved in a case in his association with Gacy. I said, libel, please. I would love to have him on a stand in a courtroom. <laughs> Better than that, to depose him, we'd get to it's, depose him. Yes. We'd get to give him a deposition, and I'm a licensed attorney and, uh, in the state. We're not handing that off to anybody else, Bill. You and I are going to – Yeah. If we so, bring Rossi up and he wants to sue please. us, oh, bring please, it. I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> bring it. Oh, because uh, because the, the defense to libel is the truth. Yes. So there would be there would be no avenue that was that was verboten in terms of us grilling him about his involvement. You know, I mean, like he would have to he'd either have to lie or he'd have to take the fifth. Like right. like getting into the Zick stuff with him, that alone. No. I mean, people that don't know the Michael Rossi story, I mean, they have to understand that Gacy put Zick like who is one of the later victims, like sometime between like, I think it was a set, like a 76 victim, maybe 77. 77 and he's got, he's got Rossi asleep on the couch. When Gacy wakes up out of bed, Zick's dead in the hallway and Rossi's there. Gacy proceeds to just dump, dump the kid down into the crawl. Hasn't doesn't bury him then, but just dumps him down there, which was what he did. And then him and Rossi go to get Zick's car, which then Gacy then forges the title and yeah. Rossi drives around in this car for two years, like literally driving around yeah. in John Zick's vehicle, right. you know, and, and like the stories like that are, are like, and we'll be digging into all this stuff as we have more lives, but it's, it's unbelievable. It's like just the, the absolute negligence the indifference by the Chicago police department to me, I have no problem putting them on blast, you know? And, and it's one of those things where at the end of the day, Bill, if we're able to accomplish what we hope that we're able to accomplish and we uncover additional victims, people are going to have to answer for it. I don't care if it's been 45 years. And that's yeah. the other thing. And it, it, it's like, you talk about it's the money, but it's also people having to answer for their indifference or their negligence back then. Cause I like, I was very clear in the, in the podcast, man, 29 kids should not have died if they would have done their job on, on Johnny Buckovich. Like yes. Johnny yes. Buckovich's old man called Chicago PD once a week for two years. Did you yeah. check his boss? His boss is the guy. His boss is the guy. I'm telling you, his boss is the last guy that saw him. He went there to get paid. He vanished, you know, and they did nothing. And the father is reporting, I found my son's car, his keys, his wallet, his identification are all in the car. And Gacy's telling you that he went, the kid went to Puerto Rico. Right. You know, and Without he his, his ID. car and he, and he still has the car, his new apartment and everything. And suddenly he leaves and leaves his identification. And you know whose card is in Butkovich's wallet? Yeah. Mr. Gacy's. Mr. Gacy's business card. So yeah, it's uh it's gonna be a hell of a ride, man. Um, I'm really excited about it. I mean, like, so Bill, so we gotta give a couple, we gotta get a little love out. Uh Joanne, we love you. Thank you so much for gifting that membership. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, I like to call her M Cubed and I. Uh, Joe, you're amazing. Thank you for gifting another membership. That means so much to us. We love you guys so much for doing that. And uh, obviously, anytime you guys support the show, we love that. If you guys haven't, you got to you gotta hit that like button, smash it. Also, if you're not subscribed, subscribe. That way you're going to be notified when I'm going live. I'm going to be having Bill a lot. And Bill, I wanted to kind of throw you like, uh, like, like without any kind of forewarning. So I've got, a, I've got another, my other favorite cop, my second favorite cop to Bill Dorsch. A uh, guy named Joe Jackalone. He's a he's a former New York City homicide detective, so he's real active with the the Hewerman thing. Oh. I thought it would be really interesting 
to have two my two favorite cops on alive so we could compare and contrast what's going on currently with the Hewerman thing and what didn't go on with Gacy. Cause I think like, I, I just wanted to become crystal clear what we're trying to do here. And, and essentially what we're trying to do is basically a two man team is what they have a task force. That's going to be trying to dig into the Hewerman stuff. Now I imagine bill, as you and I go through this thing that we're going to have a lot of people offering to help us. I think that we'll be able to form a little bit of an army behind us because there's people that just care about victims. There's oh. people that, that care about advocacy. There's people that want to help. And I, I think that we're going to soon find out that we've got, that we, we got people out there that will help us out in terms of boots on the ground. But like, would you be interested in doing that? Oh, sure. All right. Cause I, I did number one, I think you guys would really get along. You're both salt of the earth guys, both straight shooters, <laughs> both great cops. And it's a New York cop and a Chicago cop and you're both homicide dicks. And what's better than that, you know, and, and you both have like this, this serial killer thing that you got going on. Mallory Bitterman with another amazing gift. I like, I don't have any of those fun little graphics that Jay and, and, uh, Dan and Steve do my publicly buzz brothers. Um, and, and like Bill, like I've got a crew, uh, I've got, I've got a couple other shows that are my family that, that like we draw a lot of their viewers in and we like, we like to, we're, we're basically a team. Um, and hopefully we've got a major announcement coming up in the very new future, but publicly buzzed our, our show, uh, and we're all true crime and we're all advocates and we're all, People that really focus on trying to help people, trying to help victims, trying to get stories out there, looking at cold cases, trying to help missing persons, yeah. like anything that we can think of in terms of what's going on in the true crime world from an advocacy perspective, like that's our community. And like you, you'll you'll find out the more you're on here. And I don't know if you get to see the the, you know, the chat bill, but people love you. Uh, they respect the hell out of you. They love your voice. They love your gravelly voice. Between you and I, like we could do, we could do some some recordings and put people to sleep uh, for a okay. living professionally. I wanted to put. You said put people to sleep. I want to bring something up. Uh, I told you earlier. Uh, my wife is really happy about us doing this at this time here, three in the morning. <laughs> Why is that, Bill? Because uh, for many years, my wife has said that. Uh, with no evidence there's no physical evidence there's no <laughs> there's no audio there's no living witness that can confirm this but she claims that i snore <laughs> so my being here with you at three in the morning she's very very happy with that she would <laughs> like us to continue doing this bill are you a uh, snore denier is that what you well, are i i too am a snore denier i'm like there's, there's no, no evidence snore. no evidence at all and of course, <laughs> we know women don't snore oh uh, uh, Oh man, Bill, like I'm, I'm the same. And I, it, like, you know, there's no way I snore. It's like, it's impossible. Right. Right. Charmaine. Whoa. Five podcast memberships. And y'all, I put on some like cool little, uh, Stevie Irwin, my boy, he came up with some really cool graphics. So all the, all our members of the show, I got some Jordans out there. So the, all the OG members like have these cool little Jordans on there. You know, I like the goat, is a Chicago guy. So like, I don't know, you can't be, you, you can't be repping the goat with Jordans if you're not from Chicago. So it's, it's like, and, and Bill, we're very much Chicago guys. Yeah. So, uh, I mean that that's, that's very clear. So Charmaine, thank you so much. You're amazing. Uh, I uh, so appreciate that incredible generosity. It means so much Shannon shaming. So Shannon is uh, oh, yeah. a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. She is a wonderful human being. And she is the better half of my boy, uh, The Shaming of Jay, which is another one of the shows that is in our, uh, in oh, our wow. partnership of like awesomeness. So uh, thank you, Shannon. Thank you for your generosity. We appreciate that. So, Bill, um, here's what I'm thinking, man. Like, I, I love being able to do the lives with you. I know it's a huge ask of you. Like, oh. and, and people are asking if the robe is for real, like for real, like Bill is in Europe. That's, oh, not yeah. like, uh, that's not like a little thing that we're doing. Like Bill is literally up at what time is it your time right now, Bill? Oh, 
God, it's 420 a.m. People. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how dedicated Bill is uh, to what we're doing. Bill tells me, I don't care what time it is. I'm there. I, I can't give better proof than that of how dedicated yeah. the man is to what we're doing. Well, it's all about getting the truth. That's what investigation is about. You, you follow you follow the information wherever it takes you. And, and in law enforcement, that's that's your focus is always there to build a case on facts and present it in a courtroom. That's what okay. it's all about. And I'm not stopping. As long as I'm alive and I can help people and maybe get an answer to a, a few more places and a few more lost victims, I'm going to be there. I, this is getting up in the morning and doing this. This is not a problem for me. I love I'm you, man. I'm happy to do it. Well, I, I, not only do I love you, so do you see when I'm putting these little messages up on the screen, Bill? Yes. See that? You see that? Yeah. So Mallory wants you to know that she loves you. And there's just yeah. been... Wait here. <laughs> she wants you to be her grandfather, Bill. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, I, I would think you should be a little younger. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're uh, being, so here. Here's what I'm thinking, Bill. I, like I love I, I love kids. So I mean, you, you do. You're you're uh, you're wonderful in every way. So I, I'm thinking uh, I'm talking about getting Joe on around the same time uh, next Monday. Uh, and again, Bill, before we go, what's that little thing behind you there, behind your, your shoulder? Why don't you pull that up? Because one of the things that we want you all to do, you got homework. And if you want to know the things that we're not getting into, but that exist in the world in terms of what Bill's investigated, I highly recommend. And I'll have the links for the replay crew that'll link you to Amazon so you can get Bill's book, Omnipotent. It's amazing. This is 20 years plus of right. Bill's blood, sweat, and tears have gone into that book. And I know a ton of people that were uh, of the thousand plus that watched our first stream have, have bought your book. So uh, I could not recommend it more. Uh, it's it's really an incredible read. And, it, and it's coming from such a place of like love in terms of, you know, like you're, you're just, you can, you can read something and know we're, a person's like they're coming from in it and and you can read that book and you just know that, that like everything in that book is just ringing from man i want to help people i want to help these people like i want to get the truth out there yeah. and it's 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 incredible man so uh so everybody buy the book put it up there again bill stick it right like full blown in the in the picture that's it so like i said we'll have we'll have the link uh in the show notes so make and, sure uh, you all buy the book and next oh, time so, yeah there it I, goes. I just, thank you, I just, thank you I, shannon she put it in the chat okay um i wanted to say next time i want to get into uh mrs marino and her son michael okay cool okay. and then but here's what i want to do i want to lock you in for i'm talking like monday monday sure i want to do monday but we're gonna have joe on too i'm gonna have both cops on you can get into miss marino all you want uh, well you i'll follow your lead yeah, no it'll it'll be that. great. It'll it'll like, I just kind of want to sit there and watch two great cops just shoot the shit about like what you guys do for a living and what you guys did back in the day, and you're both just you've done it. You know, you've done the real stuff. You know, and and it's you're both you're gonna see. You guys are both gonna hit it off. I, I expect a full blown like bromance to develop right right before oh. my very eyes between just a couple old cops. Mm -hmm. uh, so hey. All right, Bill, if you can, I want you to crawl back into bed, wake your wife up with your horrific snoring, because we all know you're a massive snorer. Uh, there's no denying that. But no, I I, uh, I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for, for getting up at this crazy hour, uh, because we really, really appreciate it. It means the world to us. And I'm so excited to be doing this with you. And uh, we're going to keep rocking, my brother. I'll be there, buddy. All right, my friend. Thank Take you. care. Sweet Good dreams. Night. All right, man. All right. Bye-bye. All right, y'all. Uh, so Bill is an amazing man. Um, I could not love him anymore. I'm super excited that we're doing this. And we got to do this now because Bill's getting old. Like Bill says it to me all the time. He's like, man, I'm getting old. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Chan. If y'all aren't subbed, 
Like, I'm going to turn on that thing that Jay has that you can't chat unless you're subscribed. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't subscribe to the channel. It seems weird to watch it and not subscribe to it unless you hate it. I don't know how you can watch this and hate it. Um, so, like, please, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Like, I like to bully people into doing that. And also, like, gets like I don't know how the algorithm works, but Jay and Shannon tell me that the, the liking and Steve and Dan say the likes, smashing the likes help. So, I, like, I'm an old man. I don't understand, you know, like the whole algorithm thing. So you guys just have to, uh, you know, you guys are just going to have to do that for me. And all my people out there, I love you guys so much um, for hanging with me. I've actually got a... I'm trying to get Delphi boots on the ground tomorrow. So it's, uh, I don't even know what time it is. 8.30 my time. Uh, and it's not in Delphi. It's, it's not in Carroll County. It's up uh, in a different county. So it's a little bit longer of a drive. So I got to try to get up there. So I can tell you what's all going on with Delphi because um, that's a crazy case. And you guys know that I like to give you just facts. So uh, without further ado, and again, I still haven't come up with a sign off. Other than I love y'all and I'm always going to give you just facts. See ya.